Hi, my name is Mark Brosens. I'm a producer on The Agenda with Steve Pakin on TVO. And today I'm joined by Andrew Watson. He is a PhD candidate in history at York University. And we're going to be talking about the environmental history of Muskoka today. How are you doing, Andrew? I'm great. Thanks for having me on, Mark. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. So I learned from you and your research that it was all the way to the 1850s that Muskoka was almost exclusively uh, a place inhabited by First Nations peoples. Can you tell us a bit about how those people interacted with the land, with the environment of Muskoka? Yeah, absolutely. So the uh, the First Nations uh, of South Central Ontario are Algonquin speaking peoples, uh, except for one group that's uh, Mohawk that arrived in around the 1880s. But the Algonquin speaking peoples, the, the Chippewa of Rama, the Chippewa of Georgina Island, and the Chippewa of Bosse Island, as well as the Ojibwa of uh, Perry Island, which is now a Soxing First Nation. Um, Muskoka for them was basically uh, uh, traditional hunting territories for them. It was part of a larger suite of places that they moved between over the course of the year for different seasons, had different resources available to them. And so for uh, late fall and winter, they would come to Muskoka to hunt, to hunt deer and trap beaver and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and for the rest of the season, they would spend time at over either in Georgian Bay or around Lake, Lake Simcoe for other resources, particularly fish. But Muskoka was always a very important area for them to return each season uh, in order to get things like uh, like deer skins and, and fur pelts. Uh, and it's also part of a really rich part of their uh, cultural history because it helped identify their dotum structure, which is basically the way that they uh, arrange their, their society culturally. So in the 1850s, Euro-Canadian started coming into Muskoka. At that time, I think the Canadian economy is pretty much dominated by things like agriculture and resource extraction, like forestry. Uh, was Muskoka a good place to do those things then? Well, at, at the time, in the, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, a lot of southern Ontario was quickly filling up in terms of agricultural land available. A lot of people were leaving to go either settle in the in the United States or beginning in the, the very first uh, movements to of people moving out to parts of Western Canada and the prairies, and the the, the people that were uh, looking after Ontario at the time, the government was a little bit concerned with this out migration, and in an attempt to try and make more room for people who wanted to come to Ontario to settle and have land and start a farm. Uh, the opening of the Ottawa-Huron Tract, of which Muskoka was just one part, was sort of uh, seen as a, as a way of trying to make this, this uh, ideal available for, for newly arrived immigrants and people who may be the next generation of, of, uh, of inhabitants of Ontario who weren't going to be able to find that in southern Ontario. Of course, uh, for those who know the shield, it's, uh, it's, um, Muskoka is at the very southern edge of it. It has very thin, acidic soils. And so it's, it's not really that well suited to agriculture. Uh, of course, most people didn't know that at the time. They sort of saw the advertisements to try and entice people to come and settle here. Free grant land was made available, 100 acres to 18-year-old uh, males. And so a lot of people arrived sight unseen in some cases or with a, a variety of mixed information about what to expect. But it didn't take them long as they started to clear the land to realize that the only thing you can really farm in Muskoka are rocks. <laughs> so they, uh, a lot of them uh, struggled for a long time. A few people left, um, but a, a lot of families still stay for multi-generations and, and still do today, try and farm and eke out a living through agriculture in Muskoka. Um, but also Muskoka was really attractive uh, during the 19th century, especially for the Ontario government because they got a lot of money from it uh, in timber harvesting, timber resource extraction. And so the, the white pine was the most attractive resource in Muskoka, and a lot of, uh, quite a few large uh, lumber companies uh, came in here and, and pretty much took as much white pine uh, as quickly as they could. And, and that, for a while, that was a, a big part of the Muskoka's economy. So today we know of Muskoka as the heart of Ontario's cottage country. When did it start to be decided or realized that that was probably the best use for this land? When did that transition start to happen? Well, I, I, the earliest settlers to come, or the earliest tourists to come up to Muskoka uh, arrived in the early 1860s. So, in, in a sense, uh, tourism uh, begins in Muskoka almost at the same time as settlement does, and almost at the same time as logging does. 
Now, that sort of suggests that everything was happening all at the same places, uh, at the same times, everywhere. Um, but some places, there was mostly just logging. In some places, it was just settlement. But around the, the lake shores is where tourism really uh, started and, and got going in the 1860s and the 1870s. Um, tourists from the city, uh, the first couple tourists were a couple of U of T students who on kind of a LARF, kind of an, a sort of an adventurous LARF of trying to go up and, and get into the wilderness of, of central Ontario. Uh, they, they left uh, Toronto by train, got to Lake Simcoe, had to take a steamboat up to Lake Kuching and a rowboat uh, up to a place called Washago. And then from there, walked up to Muskoka the last 15 kilometers or so. And there wasn't much there at the time. Uh, there was really just a few settlers at the time. But they continued to come back year after year. Um, and folks liked them. As Muskoka started to develop a name for itself as a, as a place to visit, um, other people started to do similar things. And over time, uh, a cottaging culture evolved out of it. But there's also quite a few people who came up and stayed at uh, what became hotels and resorts, which really evolved out of settlers who turned their farms that re weren't really all that successful into uh, hotels, boarding houses, and in some cases quite lavish resorts for people from the cities to, to come up and stay. So as much as these things, uh, tourism, settlement, logging, sort of all happen in quick succession or have a lot of overlap, it's really only next to the shores that tourism gets going and you have the overlap where you could where you have um, settlers uh, right next to cottagers and resorts and booms of logs being towed across the lake during the height of the logging era as well. Oh, a lot of the people, oh, sorry, 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 go ahead. You know, I, I was going to say a lot of the people that did come up to Muskoka uh, as as uh, tourists and cottagers were from Toronto and Hamilton uh, primarily, but there were also a number of Americans. Muskoka early on uh, became quite a, uh, an attractive spot for Americans from uh, a lot of the industrial cities around the Rust Belt, like Cleveland and Pittsburgh, Buffalo. Um, a lot of them came up and spent their summers up here, either in resorts or at cottages too. So it's not just a southern Ontario kind of thing. Muskoka very quickly developed uh, quite a reputation in North America generally. That's interesting. Uh, how did they come to know about Muskoka? Because you would think that they would have their own cottaging areas that they could go to in New York State. Uh, why would they come to southern Ontario for their cottaging? Yeah, you're right. A lot of them did. So was, uh, um, quite a number came up to Muskoka, but there are also a lot of uh, cottaging areas uh, in, in the Adirondacks, for example, or in, in places in Michigan. Uh, but for whatever reason, and uh, it's, it's tough to say exactly why, but there was a certain appeal for the sort of rugged wilderness of Canada. The expectation and the assumptions were that it was really untouched wilderness. Um, and a lot of people knew that it was the sort of the first generation of having been opened for settlement, um, but it, it had a reputation for being extremely remote and, and in the wilderness. But at the same time, extremely easy to access because of the direct train routes that went from a lot of these American cities around the Great Lakes right into Toronto and then in some cases you had direct routes from places like Pittsburgh or direct trains for directly from Pittsburgh right up to Muskoka so there, there quickly developed the, uh, the, um, the ease of access for American tourists and that had a lot to do with it too I think the ease of getting here. What you say there with, uh, you know, thinking of it as untouched uh, wilderness, I think we still have those ideas about Muskoka today. It's kind of the Canadian shield as, you know, our mind as we always thought it has been. Uh, can you tell us a bit about how natural Muskoka still is compared to how it was originally? Have the has the cottage industry changed the land there very much? Right. Well, it, it's, a, it's interesting because uh, cottagers uh, for a long time, certainly since the rise of environmentalism in the 60s and 70s, have always been very keenly aware of, of preserving the environment. And if you go back before that, the sort of the wilderness ideal of a getting out of the city and surrounding yourself with a, in a natural setting has always appealed to people who want to sort of maintain what they thought of as a, as a pristine environment. So the, uh, the, uh, the sort of environmental ethics has always been part of cottaging and tourism in Muskoka. Uh, but there have also been, in order to make cottaging possible in Muskoka, there's also been a lot of really dramatic changes that have been uh, that have been done to uh, 
both the terrestrial and aquatic environments in Muskoka. Setting aside some of the impacts of logging and agriculture, which had even more um, intense impacts for the environment in Muskoka, um, in order for cottaging and tourism to become uh, possible in Muskoka, all the lakes in Muskoka sort of had to be made navigable. So for a long time, the only way to get to places in Muskoka was really by by a steamboat and then later on by, by motorboat to a certain extent. It wasn't until after World War II that roads really became uh, super accessible for everybody cottaging in Muskoka. Uh, but to make the lakes navigable, they had to do things like um, dam, uh, dam a, cu uh, a couple of waterfalls, create a set of locks, and, and basically modify the, uh, the lake system so that you could drive a steamboat from one end of the lakes all the way to the other. Um, that's one aspect of it. Um, as, as time went on and more people subdivided property, you also have a lot more pressure and concerns about um, how, how big uh, lot sizes are allowed to be in Muskoka, how many sh feet of shorefront you can have for a cottage. And it really wasn't until the, uh, the 70s that a lot of the rules were put in place to limit how, uh, how small a piece of a parcel of land you could subdivide in order to make a cottage. So you have uh, a number of places, uh, especially in, in bays and more accessible areas, where you see many cottages right next to each other, dotted up, lined uh, in close proximity. Um, and since then, the rules have been uh, such that you have to subdivide, so you have at least 300 feet of shoreline. Your cottage is uh, only about uh, 70 feet back from the shore. And there's new rules about septic systems and, that and whatnot. Uh, one of the biggest concerns would be water quality these days in, in, in Muskoka. It's one of the biggest issues. And um, in, the, in almost every way, the water quality is better now than it was uh, during the 1860s and 1870, mostly because of land clearance and the amount of uh, erosion that occurred in, in conjunction with logging and land clearance. So in a lot of ways, uh, the water quality is better now. But it's one of the big issues that landowners in Muskoka really are concerned about nowadays, and it's probably the one thing that the most resources are devoted to uh, in terms of the environment in Muskoka today. For my last question, you're kind of a good person to ask, especially where you are right now, as I said right off the top. You're looking out on a lake in, uh, in Muskoka itself right now. That's what's behind you. Do you think that Muskoka being the heart of cottage country has been a net environmental positive or negative for the district of Muskoka itself? Right. That's a good question. I mean, it really does uh, get you, it's a, it's a mental exercise to imagine uh, what Muskoka might look like if it wasn't for tourism and cottaging, really. Um, as I was saying a little bit earlier, the, the first settlers to come up here realized that it wasn't great for agriculture. And after about 1900, it started becoming less important as a logging area. And so the economy really by 1900 is really um, in almost every way dependent and reliant on tourism for its main economic uh, generator. And so to, to imagine what would Muskoka would be like without tourism is kind of, uh, it's, well, it's complicated, but it's also a little troubling because there probably wouldn't be as much of a, a, an economy in Muskoka without tourism and cottaging. So in one sense, uh, if you want to look at it a couple ways, you, you, you might have um, a more undisturbed shoreline, you might have more naturalized spaces, uh, certainly less cottages all along the shoreline, so maybe the lake system and some of the shoreline uh, ecosystems would maybe be a little bit more intact and a little bit more healthy. That's, what, that's one side of thing. The other side of thing would be that uh, without tourism, uh, and cottaging, you end up in a situation where there might be more reliance on resource extraction. And so Muskoka might not be, might not actually be as intact uh, without tourism as it is with tourism. So it's, it's a funny way to, to think about it, but um, it really depends on what else you could do with Muskoka's economy if not for tourism and cottaging. But I would say, to answer your question, I would say Muskoka's uh, environment is actually much better off uh, with tourism and cottaging as its prime uh, economy than it would be if something like mining or forestry, as you see further north on the shield, was its main economy. Well, it's all very interesting stuff. Uh, thank you very much. That's Andrew Watson. He's a PhD candidate in history at York University. He has his uh, dissertation coming out soon on the environmental history of Muskoka. And what's the title on that, Andrew, so everyone can look it up once it gets out there? Sure. Poor Soils and Rich Folks. Uh, 
Household Metabolisms and Sustainability from about 1850 to 1920. Well, I'll definitely be reading that when it comes out. So I hope you can enjoy the uh, nice Muskoka waterfront there, and uh, have a great day. Go, go for a swim. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <laughs>